Hi there, I'm Kathleen Jasper, and today I'm talking about the Praxis Core Reading Exam. This is part one of a two-part series, and in this portion, I talk about the structure of the Praxis Core Reading Exam and how to identify the different types of questions that you will see on this exam. Let's get started. So this is um, Praxis Core Reading. We're talking about 5713, but 5713 is all about reading comprehension. Two things you need to know about this test, and I'm going to talk about the scoring because we've had a lot of questions about the scoring, and I'm going to get my calculator out here so I don't mess up any of my math. But the code for this test, again, is 5713. You have 85 minutes. That's according to the Praxis Core Study Companion. We're going to break that down in a second. But um, some people have said you get 90 minutes, but the companion says 85 minutes. So I'm going to go with that. If you got an extra five minutes, awesome. If you didn't, you know, 85 minutes is the, is the um, time allotted for this test. There are 56 selected response questions. That means multiple choice. That's a fancy word for multiple choice. Some of the multiple choice is one question, right? Or one answer choice that is correct. And some have multiple answer choices that are correct. So this is a little different than the FTCE reading. If you're on for that, you only have to pick one answer choice. For the uh, Praxis Core, you have to, sometimes, some, some questions you have to pick more than one. And we're going to talk about that in a second. Now, in terms of a passing score, most states want a 156, okay? Now, it all depends on your state, so you need to make sure you are going by what your state says, but for the most part, um, the your state sets your score. So everybody's different, but it pretty much is a 156 is a standard there. Now, let me quickly, let me, um, let me go out here. One thing that I always tell people is that you should always, always, always check the study companion. The study companion is going to be the best thing that you can reference on this exam. So very quickly, I'd like to go through that with you today. Um, I always go through the study companion because it's very, very, very important. It is the outline of the test. And I, I'm also gonna break it down a little bit more, but definitely get the study companion information. So we have, you know, the, the content categories here. Notice these three content categories right here. Key ideas and details, craft structure and language skill, and integration of knowledge and ideas. Now let me tell you something about this. This is always the same on every single reading test. Every single reading test tests the exact same skills. So that means standardized assessments for your 10th graders. That means ACT, SAT, they all test the same stuff, you guys. Key idea and details, craft structure and language skills, and integration of knowledge and ideas. They may be slightly worded differently, um, but that's the only difference. The same skills are assessed on every single reading test, and I know this because I break down reading tests all day long as my job. So take my word for that. Now, as you scroll down deeper, they get more into what these skills mean. And we're going to talk about that today too. But it's really helpful to know when you get to a question, you know, just to have an overarching understanding. Ah, this is a key ideas and details question. This is this kind of question. So that's really important here. Then they have, you know, the different types of passages. And we're going to talk about that. On the Praxis Core, you might get a passage that's just a paragraph with one question. You could get a longer passage like this one over here with two questions. And you could get a double passage and you could get a chart or a graph. So they kind of span the gamut of what you should be responsible for when it comes to a um, reading test, all different types of reading passages, okay? But remember, this particular document is your friend. All you have to do is Google Praxis Core Reading um, Study Companion, and it comes up right here. And I'll throw this in the email for you as well if you signed up for this exam, okay? Okay, so let's break it down now. Now that we know that um, you're going to have, you know, different types of questions, you're also going to have questions where you choose one answer choice and one where you choose another answer, or more than one answer choice. So take a look at this question right here. Notice it says choose two statements, which the author of the passage would agree. So in this case, you're gonna have to, you know, uh, maybe choose this one here. I need to use a different color, sorry guys. I meant to use yellow, but now I know that there's a bunch of yellow. So maybe we choose this, this one here and this one here, okay? 
And then this question over here, they want you to choose one question. Now, this is where scoring can get kind of tricky. And I always like people to understand how you score your tests. Because not that I want you to focus like, ooh, you know, there's one point here and there's one point there because that can be bad. I want you to focus on the reading. But it helps to understand how your scores work. And the praxis is kind of weird how they work. Okay, so basically the praxis reading and all of their tests are on a sc scale score of 100 to 200. So that means that the lowest, the lowest um, portion is, the, the lowest score you can get is a 100. And the highest score you can get is a 200, okay? So make sure you understand that. That's really important. Now, when you do your test, you get a raw score, which is the percentage. How many percent did you get right out of, out of how many? So let's say out of 56 questions, you got 30 correct. That's your raw score. 30 is your raw score. Now, the way, it, the way it's done is you take 30 and you divide it by 56 and you get a percentage. And in this case, you have a 50 3%. That's if every question is worth one point, which is just that select one answer choice. So you've got a 53%. And what you need to do is add the one. So this is really a 153 because of the 100 uh, to 200 point scale. Just trust me, put the one in front of your, your percentage. So this would not be a good enough score. You would be too low for most states. You need a 156. But the kicker is this. Let me just tell you, let me just erase this really quickly. I need a bigger. There we go. There we go. Um, that's if every question is worth one point, but we know that some questions are worth more than that. So let's take a look at this scenario here. Let's say you got a 56 question test and 52 of those questions are straight up choose the right answer. There's one right answer, A, B, C, D, or E. That's it. On the praxis, it goes from A to E. So you have five answer choices that you can choose from. Now, 52 of them are straight up one answer questions. So they are worth basically 52 points, right? But then you might have two questions that have two answers. So they're worth four points, okay? Each question's worth two. So two, two plus two is four. So these two questions give you four points. And then you might have two questions that have three correct answers. Choose the three correct answers. So in that case, these two questions are worth three each. So that total is six. So now instead of out of 56, you're out of here, you're out of 62. So if you got you know 30 correct out of 62, you're at a 48%, a 148, that's not even 50% correct. So you need a 156, let me just lasso this and delete, there we go. You need a 156, that means you need at least 56% correct. However, when you get into this part here where it's extra points for certain, um, for certain questions, that kind of methodology breaks down. So I am going to tell you here today, I think you should shoot for anywhere from a 62 to a 65% correct, okay? That kind of puts you in a safe zone. Now again, I don't know which test you're gonna get. I don't know if you're gonna get two questions that have um, two answer choices and three questions that have two answer choices. I don't know. Every test is different and we shouldn't know. It's a standardized assessment. Like it's a state standardized test. You're not going to know. But just know that there are going to be a few questions in there, not a lot, that have more than one answer. So those are worth more. That's why I say if you shoot for a 62 um, to 65% and that's going to be roughly, let me just do the math. So let's go with 35 divided by 56. That's about 35 out of you know 56 ish questions not exact because they're weighted but i would i would shoot for a 35 out of 56 you got to shoot for more than 50 percent and a 62 to a 65 range you know 30 35 out of 56 to a 37 out of 56 is going to help you out a lot okay so just know you don't need 100 percent. you need a d you need a d to definitely pass a 156 is actually an F because a 56% is an F. Uh, however, we want to make sure you're in the safe zone. So you need a D. 
A D gets you the score you need here. So remember that, take some of the pressure off, okay? All right, so when we talk about the content of the test, we're talking about key idea, everything is pretty evenly distributed. There are 35 questions for key idea and details, 30 for craft and structure, and 35% is integration knowledge and idea. That means there's 17 to 22 questions on key ideas and details, 14 to 19 on craft and structure, and 72 to 22. Now, remember, they could be weighted, you know? This is a range. They don't give you a specific, you need this score on this. So again, focus on that 62 to 65, and I think you'll be just fine there, okay? All right, so let's go into um, what key ideas and details actually means, because it helps for you to know what is a key, idea details question, key ideas and details question. These questions tend to be the main idea and primary purpose of the passage. And I'm going to show you a couple of really easy ways to identify the main idea um, and, and eat quickly eliminate answer choices that are too specific for the main idea. Um, the other thing we're going to be looking at is obviously supporting ideas. Those are the, um, you know, the things that you can put your finger on, things that support the overall argument, right? And then finally, we're going to talk about inferences. Now, inferences is a high-level skill. You have to make educated guesses based on what is said in the passage. So you cannot just... Uh, people have a hard time with inference. They think every answer choice is correct in that scenario or more than one answer choice is correct. There's only one correct answer choice unless specified in the, in the question saying pick all that apply or pick three or pick two. But inferences are educated guess based on the passage, not based on your prior knowledge, based on what is said in the passage. And that's key. Sometimes our prior knowledge can mess up our reading comprehension scores because we're going on what we think we know and we're not going on what's in the passage. Focus on the passage. Background knowledge certainly helps in many situations, but don't rely on it to answer questions because those questions might be specific to the reading that you're working on there. All right. Now the other one of the, the, the second part of the three parts of the test is going to be craft, structure, and language skills. Now, Craft, structure, and language skills is going to be your attitude and tone. You guys know these questions. What is the tone of the passage? What is the attitude of the author? You want to be immediately thinking about this as soon as you start reading the passage. You want to say, huh, is this here to um, inform me? Is this here to um, argue with me or persuade me? Is this here to uh, be a narrative and tell me a little bit about a person's life? something like that. So you're going to want to pay close attention to that right away. You should be kind of hearing the voice of the author in your head. Is the author angry? Is the author happy? Is the author cautionary? Um, is the author's attitude positive or negative? Just kind of get those things ruminating in your head because it'll make it easier to answer those questions later. Of course, we're talking about organization as well. Those are the questions that ask you things like, how is this passage organized? It might just ask you straight up like that. It might also say, you know, is this a sequential passage versus a, um, um, a general idea given and then support is given for that idea? Is this a claim-based passage versus an, um, versus an informational passage? All of that is going to be part of the organization. So pay close attention to that as well. Also, the meaning of words, I don't know why they break it down like this. This is definitions. So these are your questions that say the word in line five um, or, or, you know, um, barrage in line five means this. And you have, you know, answer choices there. So that's going to be the definitions. And then, of course, I already said this. Is this expository, persuasive narrative? You've got to know what the author's trying to do there. Okay. And you should be thinking about this. Um, along the way. All right. Now we have integration of knowledge and ideas. So one of the things we're talking about there is analyze diverse media formats. So they may have a letter there or um, an article there or something like that. You have to kind of analyze different pieces of that. You're going to have to evaluate arguments. Now, this is the high level questions. These are the questions that you might have more than one answer choice. For example, um, which of the following arguments or which of the following two arguments would the author most likely agree? 
Now, you may not know because uh, you're like, how do I know what the author is going to most likely agree? That's where the high level thinking comes in. You've got to look at what did the author say and, and dissect what the author is thinking, analyze it and evaluate it and figure out how the author would vote or agree. And then, of course, we're going to compare and analyze more than one text. That's your passage A, passage B, double passage um, text. That Those are going to be higher level questions. Those are going to demand more of you because you have to, you know, um, look at both texts and find similarities and differences and how one supports the other or whatever. And those of you who have taken this test before, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Those double passages can be really difficult, but I have an awesome strategy for you. And those double passages are going to be super easy for you um, as we move forward. Okay. Now the four main types of things you're going to have to do on this test is like I said, when we were looking at that study companion, you're going to have those short passages. Those are the ones that are just like a paragraph in one question or a paragraph in two questions. No more than that. So people think, oh, those are easy. Those are the um, short passages. Sometimes a small passage can be more difficult than a long passage. Those short passages, you really got to understand those to answer the questions. So those sometimes can be more difficult than the longer passages. Then, of course, you've got the long passages here. You've got, um, you know, it's a full page or, or a longer page. Typically on the FTCE, if you're joining us here for the FTCE reading, you basically have just long passages. You don't have these really mini short passages like on the Praxis, but practice with those short passages because they still sharpen your reading skills. You're going to get the double passage, you know, which would author A agree with and which would author B agree with those types of questions. How does passage A relate to passage B? You know, those types and those can be difficult. But again, I got a, I got a hack for that that you can use. And then you're going to be given charts and graphs. Um, you'll be given some sort of stimuli up at the top and then underneath it'll be an explanation of what the chart explains or what the chart represents and then you'll have to answer questions based on that. So that's a little bit different than the FTCE reading. They don't give you charts and graphs. They might be embedded in the, in the passage but for the Praxis reading you actually just have a full-on chart. And this really aligns to the SAT, ACT, many of the skills that our high school students are required to do. This test is aligned to the skills that 10th graders should have before leaving high school. Um, they start taking their 10th grade reading exams in 10th grade, and they have till the end of high school to pass them in many states. Um, in order to graduate with a standard diploma. So I know a lot of people get upset about this test and say, hey, this is really hard. Well, this mirrors the exact same skills that a high school graduate from a public school will have to have. So if you want to be a teacher, you have to have the same skills as a high school, what we expect from our high school graduates. And I think that's fair. You know, if high school graduates are expected to pass this test, then the teachers in the classroom should also have an understanding of these skills. Now, that being said, you might need some practice and some support. And that's why we're here today with you. All right. Now, I'm going to tell you this. I always say it. You guys know if you've taken my classes, work backwards. And notice what I did there. This should have been over here. I capitalized it. Work backwards. I was trying to be funny. A little play on words there. Maybe it landed. Maybe it didn't. But um, you're going to want to start with the questions first and move backwards through the text. I don't mean read the text backwards. I mean you're going to start with the task first. Most people start reading the passage first. Start with the question, set the purpose root reading and figure out what you're being asked to do. And then of course, you're going to want to think like a test maker. Think like a test maker, not a test taker. One of the things you want to be um, cognizant of is that these, these tests are written a certain way and they're all written the same way. And if you can figure out the pattern and if you can really practice and understand exactly what's going on in terms of the questioning, you will have a better chance. Now, that being said, this is also going to take a lot of reading practice. If you're struggling with this test, you're going to have to read more. See a lot of people online saying, what Quizlet did you use to pass the reading? Well, Quizlet doesn't really help you with the reading skills you need to pass this 
this exam. Now you might get lucky. Somebody might have made a Quizlet that has similar passages, um, which is against the rules, by the way. You're really not supposed to do that. But it might have similar questions or answer choices. And you may get a sa the same test as the person who made that Quizlet. But it's likely that you won't get the same test. So the only way to be 100% sure that you can do this is if you practice. And I've got a lot of ways for you to practice this test. So don't worry. But remember, think like a test maker. And I'm going to show you how to do that today. And of course, practice.